You know, farming is just one facet of North Carolina's rich and varied heritage, but the history of our state doesn't tell the whole story of North Carolina's past and its people. And tonight we begin a special report that turns back the pages. News Channel 11's Miriam Thomas is with us now to tell us a little bit more about that. Miriam. Hello again, George and Monica. You know, we all remember, I think, studying history as children, the American Revolution, the World Wars, the U.S. Civil Rights Movement. But one of the most fascinating periods of American history is missing from the pages of most books, the period known as the Jim Crow era. Now researchers are going behind the veil to record this history before it's lost forever. The term Jim Crow dates back to the early 1800s when it was used to describe minstrels in blackface. White performers darken their faces with burnt cork before taking their song and dance routines to the stage. Jim Crow later became shorthand for the separate but unequal form of legal segregation in the South, beginning after the Civil War and ending with the civil rights struggles of the 1960s. It was a difficult period for blacks, knowing the system did not and would not include them. Jim Crow meant separate facilities for whites and coloreds. It meant hard work for little pay, segregated, dilapidated housing for many working class blacks, separate facilities for schools. And for many black children who had to work the land alongside their parents, Jim Crow meant no school at all. But surprisingly, the Jim Crow years were also a time of strength, family unity, and community closeness for blacks. Being separated from whites in virtually every form of daily life, black folk had to do for themselves and for each other. They built their own schools, owned and operated their own businesses, cared for their sick, and invested in their own communities. I think that this is a way of uh, bridging the gap between cultures. Dr. Beverly Jones, professor of history and director of the Institute on Desegregation at North Carolina Central University, is working with scholars from Duke and UNC on a three-year research project to pull back the veil that shrouds the history of the Jim Crow era. We need to begin to look and open up that veil of obscurity, lifting the veil and saying, yes, these individuals existed. There was a community. They had a purpose. We need to validate that. That project is entitled Behind the Veil, Documenting African American Life in the Jim Crow South. As our series of reports continues tomorrow, we'll meet some of the people who are sharing their memories and indeed reshaping American history. We'll also, George and Monica, tell you how you might be able to help preserve that history. It's really a fascinating project. Yes, it is, and it's neat to see those old pictures. Yeah, yeah. nothing yeah. like it. It's great. Look forward to the next one. All right, I'll see you this time tomorrow. Thanks, okay. Mary. Thank you. There is a chapter of American history that is in the memories of many people, but is actually missing from the pages of the average history book. News Channel 11's Miriam Thomas joins us again tonight to continue a special report on an effort to change all of that. Miriam? Monica, we are following an academic research project that, in short, aims to open all of our eyes to what was an ugly chapter in American race relations, a time when segregation was the law, separate but unequal, the norm. Well, now the search is on to go behind the veil to witness an unwritten piece of history. Well, Tracing the history of African Americans in the South during the Jim Crow era is difficult because there's little or no written history documenting their families, their social lives, their struggles. That is, until now. Researchers from Duke, UNC, and North Carolina Central Universities are rediscovering a living history in those who lived it. I try to forget about those days. I can't forget about it. It, it. it happened. I cannot forget about it. But I do not let it stay in my heart that I be a hater from it. They call themselves open-minded seniors. All of these Halifax County residents lived through the so-called Jim Crow era. Now they're sharing their memories inside what used to be the Tillery Community Store. Most grew up as sons and daughters of sharecroppers, people who worked the fields of others for very little pay. For the children of sharecroppers, time in the fields meant time away from school. At six years old, with my grandmother and her sister, who was who is now deceased, her name is Almara Clark, I made two dollars and fifty cents a day. When I graduated from high school, in 1955, I was still making $2.50 a day. Some of the memories bring tears and anger. Her grandmother was a slave. 
and the master's mule stumped her foot. And the master said, you better not cry. And of course, she, she still tells the story and then she'll say, but you know what? This ain't no slavery time now. 92-year-old Susie Weathersby lost loved ones to lynchings in that era, but her words hold a lesson for today. I know how to treat people, don't care what race is, I know how to treat them. I know how to love them. And if I could do anything good for you, I'm going to do it. The oral history collected here is part of a three-year project entitled Behind the Veil. The life of African Americans is one where they can see through a veil, they can look out and see everything and understand what's going on. But the outside world can't always see what's going on behind the veil itself. Thousands of stories are still behind the veil, and the researchers on this project would like to hear from you. Call the Center for Documentary Studies at Duke University. You can reach them at 687-0486. We'll conclude our series tomorrow by meeting former students of a school built exclusively for African Americans at the turn of the century. It's right here in the heart of Carolina. And we'll talk more to those people who are involved in documenting this oral history. Monica? Thanks a lot, Mayor. We'll look for that tomorrow night. The Jim Crow era. Say that phrase in a crowded room and there are probably a lot of folks who won't know what you're talking about. But there is a move on among some area university researchers to make sure the age of legal racial discrimination is not forgotten. Miriam Thomas has been telling us about this effort for the past couple of nights. And she joins us now with more thoughts and memories from people who know all too well that separate is not necessarily equal. So true, George and Monica. You know, America is a melting pot with its mix of people from so very many ethnic backgrounds, each part of our shared history. But it is an incomplete history, which, as we've shown you this week, is beginning to change thanks to a team of researchers. They want to see that the stories of African Americans who lived through legalized segregation are preserved for generations to come. They're going behind the veil to recover these untold stories, stories rich in heritage. The first evidence you see of the history along this stretch of Highway 301 is the marker near the town of Enfield, pointing the way to Brick School. Built exclusively for blacks in 1895, this institution was the center of education and arts for many North Carolinians until it closed in 1933. I do remember uh, coming over here and, and people, you know, people just from the community came. In fact, people came from Rocky Mountain over here to those recitals. They had, and the music over here was something else. Now called the Franklinton Center, the institution lives again, thanks to concerned citizens and former students, members of what they call the Brick Club. Sitting down to lemonade, microphones, and tape recorders, these seniors recall the good times. Picked up this skunk and brought it back over to, in the car. <laughs> and the bad times at the school many of them attended nearly 70 years ago. We had uh, material and books and things to work with at Brick that we did not have in the public school. Why is it all right for the black man or the black woman to nurse the babies, to cook the food, and do all these other things, and yet be denied the simple Necessity In a way, by being segregated here, whatever, it did me a favor. But I left, I got a better job, I retired, I said I'm going to beat the system. And I'm retired now, I'm walking around, and I think I beat it. Much of the 20th century history of African Americans was made at places like Brick School, but little of it is written anywhere. Now researchers hope to go behind the veil to recover that history. I think that history has often been taken from journals and from diaries and from public documents and we interpret African-American history through other people's words and I think that this is an opportunity for African-Americans to speak their journal. I've talked to people who were sharecroppers, people who were domestic workers and then people who owned dry cleaning stores and people whose fathers were principals right out of slavery and things like that. So the dichotomy of the black experience is really telling. Sonia Ramsey is a student of history, a doctoral candidate at UNC, one of six research assistants traveling the state this summer on this three-year Behind the Veil project. 
For Sonia, it's been a link to her own heritage. I think I was driving one day, and I said, what is that white stuff on the side of the road? And my mother said, that's cotton. That's cotton. I didn't know what it was, and my mother had to pick cotton, and so did her mother, and so had a lot of the other women I've talked to on this project. The and researchers, all graduate students at Duke, UNC, and North Carolina Central, have visited or will visit Charlotte, Durham, Enfield, Wilmington, and New Bern. They hope to collect more than 3,000 tapes of oral history. It's the things that the people on the team are learning about how to work together with different kinds of people are really going to be crucial for making sure that a different kind of history gets written. And those who lived the history hope future generations will appreciate their struggles. Well, I think today is that, like it is now, I think it's a little better, he better than it was when I was coming up. He, and I thank the Lord for everything, for a change. The oral history tapes and photographs collected from the Behind the Veil project will be archived at Duke University's Center for Documentary Studies. If you would like to preserve any old documents, pictures, or perhaps oral history from the Jim Crow era, call the Duke Center for Documentary Studies at 687-0486. Each community that participates in the project will get to keep the materials collected for its own archives. And material from the project will also be made available for schools, community workers, and for scholars to study in the future. So, George and Monica, the researchers are hoping this project is really going to help bridge the gap between the generations and the races. Mm. Well, thanks, Miriam. What an incredible story. Thanks for sharing that with thanks. us. And thank Jennifer Thomas, too, because she did a nice job She's enlightening us all. She's the producer on the series of reports. She did yeah. a wonderful job. Okay. Thanks, Miriam.